when you use something like an electric space heater, right? That's one watt of power versus one watt of heat. That's a COP essentially of one is how we would describe that. Now, when you look at the coefficient of performance on a geothermal system or these air to water heat pumps, some of these newer products that are coming out, you can get a coefficient of performance as high as five, six, seven, which means it's seven times as efficient as electric heat. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owners Association, where real estate investors have found success since 1968. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 427. Anyone who owns rental property can tell you that one of the systems you must pay attention to is your heating and air conditioning system, commonly referred to as your HVAC system. Today, we're going to talk with an expert on HVAC systems who will be sharing practical tips for choosing the right one for your property, finding the best HVAC contractor, and rebates and incentives that might be available in your area. Howard Binder is the founder of the B Heat and AC a well-known Colorado-based HVAC company focused on an educational, zero-pressure approach to helping homeowners get the best and most reliable HVAC system for their house. Howard, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Give us a little bit about your background in HVAC and and, and how you kind of approach that and how you approach choosing an HVAC system. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. And my background, I've been in the HVAC industry for about 10 years. And when I first, I started my company about eight years ago. And when I, it's funny because when I first went into HVAC prior to that, I, I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, there's more to HVAC than just a little box on the wall, right? You think of like, you just turn that magic box on the wall up or down your thermostat and then, you know, suddenly air comes through the vents and your HVAC system works. But when you really think about it, you know, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. As long as it's working, you don't really think about it. And so we work with a lot of property managers. We work with uh, a lot of investors and, and they're one of our you know best customers. And one of the things that we kind of try to educate people on, and if you're a seasoned investor, you probably already know this, but there's a lot of noise out there about it. There's a couple things you have to navigate. One is kind of the efficiency laws and rebates that's in your area. Uh, but the bottom line is how do you get the most, you know, you want to know what the life cycle is on your equipment. And you also want to know what is the most reliable equipment to put into a rental. Because some people ask, you know, should I put in a high efficiency system? Really, the truth is it's, I don't want to say put in the cheapest equipment and not necessarily the cheapest contractor, but you want to put in equipment that's going to be reliable and, and is going to work. And so that's going to vary by region. But typically, like in, in Phoenix, for example, which is a new market that we just opened up, the minimum SEER rating on an air conditioning system is 14 SEER. And typically in a rental, that's what we would put in. And the reason is not because you're just trying just because you're trying to be cheap. It's actually because it's cheaper to repair and they're actually more reliable. And the truth is, is that it's if on the higher efficiency equipment, which you would put in your house, a lot of the benefits that you get from that are not going to really benefit the tenants because tenants, as you know, they don't take care of the equipment to the same extent that you might. And so if we put this high efficiency, you know, super quiet system in your house, that's going to save you money on your energy bill. It's actually not going to save you money on your energy bill if you don't do things like change the filter regularly, which believe it or not, tenants don't actually always do. Some people, you know, a lot of times they'll call us and they'll say, hey, my system's not working. It's doing X, Y, and Z. And the first question we ask in the busy seasons in the summer and the winter is, have you changed the filter yet? And you, sometimes you'll hear people say, I don't think it has a filter. And we you, you know, always joke, well, it doesn't anymore, but <laughs> it did at one point. Let me, let me jump in because I, I want to kind of take this bit by bit and, and start with the different types of systems. So when we talk about HVAC, heating and air conditioning, what are the different types of systems that people can even choose between? Basically, depending on where you are, you have furnaces, you have uh, air conditioners, you have heat pumps, which a heat pump is just an air conditioner with a reversing valve. And then you have the indoor unit, which is going to be your air handler or an evaporator coil. Now, an air handler would replace a 
a furnace. It's kind of like an all-in-one unit. You're going to see in places where it's primarily cooling only, places like Florida or Phoenix, where you don't run the heater as much, you're going to see more heat pumps or air conditioners that are just tied to an indoor air handler versus furnaces. Whereas in Colorado, we have a lot of furnaces and air conditioners. And then inside of those categories, there's more and more subsets. And there's even, there's a lot of new products coming out this year that may, maybe aren't as relevant to your listeners because they're more expensive and they might be interested in putting them in their home. So we do have videos on our channel where we talk about that. And those are things like air to water heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, and things like that. They're definitely more expensive to install. And and so the reason you would put that in your primary residence versus a a rental property is just obviously because of the, you're you're not going to recoup that cost because you're not the one responsible for the bill. Some place where you might consider that is in like an Airbnb or a hotel type setting because the utilities are actually ending up on the profit and loss statement. And so it, because it's something that you're liable for uh, versus a long-term rental where the tenant is, you know, it's an expense to them, not so much you. So you, you need to kind of assess what, what you're buying it for. Are you buying it for a tenant who's going to pay their own bills? In which case you may not want to go with the highest efficiency, most expensive system because a lot that the the bill monthly bills can be passed on to the tenant anyway or are you buying it like like you say for a short term rental where you're paying the bills then you might want to go with a better system what 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 is what is uh, i know there's a lot of choices right now but there's also a, a real high emphasis on energy efficiency and i'm wondering like in given what you're seeing in your different areas what is the highest efficiency or the 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 type of HVAC system that a lot of people are choosing to install now? What we we sell a lot of for primary residences, so like where people are, like I said, they're concerned with energy efficiency and savings is going to be, I mean, I'll mention the brand, but really there's, it's. It, I'll, I'll talk about the brand and the type. Uh, our favorite unit right now is actually what's called the Daikin Fit. And the Daikin Fit is a side discharge inverter system. So it looks like a traditional mini split, like a ductless unit that you would see in Europe that's mounted on the wall. But at least that's what the condenser looks like in terms of it's short, thin, very compact, and it blows out the side versus out the top. That's what side discharge means. And so it's, you know, a third the size of like your traditional condenser. And the reason we like those is because they're efficient. It's about a 30 to 40% savings on your bill. They're super reliable. And then they're also extremely quiet. So when we're installing those, that's more of a comfort factor. And then in environments where it's like a rental property or something, the lesser efficiency equipment that we're typically putting in is going to be just like a basic 80% single stage efficient furnace and pairing that with a 14 or a 13 C or AC, depending on what region they're in and what is kind of the minimum. And the reason we do that is just because those two for rentals, like just looking out for our investors, when we show up to a rental property, you want to get the tenant, you know, heating or cooling as soon as possible. And those lower end systems, they, we actually stock most of those parts. They take universal replacement parts that we keep in stock on our truck. And so it's easier to fix those things on the spot versus you know, the the Dyke and Fit or something that I mentioned earlier, which would require a trip to the parts house. They're still going to have all those parts in stock. It's not like, you know, stuff's on back order, but it is something that you do want to, you know, keep in mind in a investment property. And that's a great point because you you can buy a, a really great system. And then when it comes time to service it, find out, well, there's very few people who service it or the parts don't exist. Are there certain systems that you dissuade people against because of that? There are. And so it th- this is where it gets kind of tricky, right? Because it's in a in a commercial setting, you can put in systems that might be more advanced where like in a hotel, for example, they have systems called heat recovery. Heat recovery is a very efficient system. It's like a heat pump, but it actually has three refrigerant pipes instead of two. And, and the reason is, is because it can, you know, if you go to a hotel, one person could have the heater on it. The other person could have the air conditioning on. What a heat recovery system is, it's literally transferring heat from one room to the other through the refrigerant. So it's a very efficient system. Those systems are more advanced. So those might have special order parts, but they're also very reliable. They're very robust. So that's, you know, not as much an issue on on some of those, but what we steer away people from in the single family residential space is high efficiency systems. And the reason is that high efficiency, and when I say high efficiency, I'm talking about high efficiency furnaces. So this is going to be a condensing gas furnace, a 96% efficient furnace. A lot of these furnaces do qualify through for rebates through the utility. So you sometimes 
and and honestly, if you're listening to this podcast like three years from now, states are starting to pass laws that mandate higher efficiency equipment. And so if a high efficiency becomes something that is like just what you have to put in, this might be, you know, a, a non, a, not a point for discussion, it might be a, a mute point. But the reason we steer away from high efficiency furnaces is because they're a condensing gas furnace. Like I mentioned, if your tenants are not doing, if you don't have a good maintenance plan and, and the filters aren't being replaced regularly, they are more prone to have issues and so we just try to look out, you know, your tenants not going to call you because their bill is $10 higher. They're going to call you because their furnace isn't working. And so that's what we're always guarding against and the and you know, from an investment perspective. What kind of maintenance then should, once you put in these systems, how should people approach maintenance because you talked about changing the filters things like that. What are some of the mistakes you see people making? So the biggest thing is a filter change. So really if you can either educate your tenants on how to change the filter or if that's not something you want to do, if you can just get the filter changed at least once in the fall and once in the spring so that way you're good for the heating season and you're also good for the summer. Typically, you know, that filter will probably be after a six month period will probably be pretty dirty. But, you know, especially if tenants have dogs and things like that. But the that's enough maintenance to if you do nothing else, that will typically keep it in good shape. And then the maintenance that we recommend for someone that like when we come out and do an annual maintenance, in addition to that, if it is a piece of high efficiency equipment, one of the added things that we're always doing is actually pulling, this is kind of technical, but it's basically a condensate trap that is on your high efficiency furnace. Those get, that's a notorious thing that will get clogged up with sediment and debris. And if it's not, and it's so simple, if that's not cleaned out, it will back up and then it will cause different issues. And if someone's, your technician's not familiar, with what a pressure switch air code is, they won't know. That's kind of the first thing we check because if everything's been working for two, three years and then it suddenly stops, normally it's because that got dirty. And so just those two things alone on the heating side will keep you in a good shape. And then on the air conditioning side, uh, the biggest thing is again, filter changes because a lot of times if you ever get a call from your tenant and they say something like it's not blowing cold air or it's iced up and they see a brick of ice either you know on uh, the refrigerant lines or on the outdoor door unit, uh, that's going to be a combination of either a dirty coil, a dirty filter, a dirty condenser, which is your outdoor unit. And really, when we're doing basic maintenance, what we're doing is we're checking the outdoor unit to make sure it's clean. And a lot of times dirt, pollen, debris builds up over time. So we typically, you can hose those off just with a garden hose. You don't want to use a pressure washer that will damage it because it's actually too much pressure for the fins and, and it can actually cause damage to the system. But if you do those two things alone, where you just hosed off the condenser once a year and then changed your filter, that's going to put you, you know, miles ahead of most people. <laughs> Even saying that, I can tell you when I go look at, at my system in my house and, and I, if I were to try to do the things you just said, I'd be thoroughly confused as to what to, where to even look and where to find it. So, you know, I, I would just say that if you, if you're like me and you're clueless about these things, have a, a, some sort of maintenance contract with your, your HVAC person so they can come and, and take care of that once or twice a year. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's normally cheap to get done. I mean, like our annual maintenance, we have a, a promotion where we come out for free for first time customers. And then our annual maintenance after that is, is typically 129 a system. So you're not talking about, it's not an exorbitant cost to, to keep a system in, in good shape. Let's talk about heat pumps because I've been hearing more and more that heat pumps are the most energy efficient system, HVAC system that's available right now. Can you talk about what a heat pump is and how it works and, and then whether that is true or not? We love heat pumps. We install a ton of heat pumps. And one of the myths about heat pumps, depending on where you're listening in from, is if you're in a colder climate, you might have local contractors telling you that heat pumps don't work in cold climates. And that actually couldn't be further from the truth unless the exception is like very cold Arctic climates. But that's most of like, you know, our Canadian neighbors and north, because typically it has to get below about negative 10 Fahrenheit before heat pumps just like absolutely don't work. And when I say below negative 10, I mean, they get below negative 10 and then they stop and it stays there for maybe, you know, a month or something, a long enough period of time that your backup heat is kicking in. And what we install a lot of in Colorado is what's called dual fuel applications. And I'll talk about kind of the heat pumps that you want to put in, if this is again, something that's for your personal home. And if it's for, you know, a uh, uh, an investment property, you, again, you're just going to put in what you really want to talk to a local contractor because it varies widely. But like in the southern regions, 
any basic single stage heat pump, there's really three categories just to kind of back up a little bit. There's really three categories of heat pumps or air conditioners. And, and it starts with single stage systems. A step above that is what's called a multi-stage system. That's like a two stage, three stage, five stage, but it's a staged system. And then there's inverters. And typically when we're doing a bid, we quote out a single stage system as an option, and we also quote out an inverter. We don't even bother with the multi-stage systems. And the reason is because a lot of times the price difference between a multi-stage and inverter is such that they're basically the same price. And an inverter is a much better system from an efficiency standpoint. A single stage system is what you're used to. It's either on or it's off. And all a heat pump actually is, just to kind of explain it so people understand, it's just an air conditioner with a reversing valve. And what that reversing valve does is it reverses the flow of refrigerant in your system. And if you want to understand what's happening, if you've ever gone out to your condenser in the summer and put your hand over the top of the box outside and felt the hot air coming off of the fan, what's actually happening, the reason the air is so warm is because it's taking air from, or it's taking heat from inside your home and transferring it outside through refrigerant. And so what happens in the winter with a heat pump is if you put your hand on top of your condenser, it would actually be blowing cold air because it'd be taking heat from outside and transferring it to the refrigerant and then transferring it to your air handler inside. And so if you live in a cold climate and you're going to put most of the, like, for example, in Colorado, the, the system that we put in the most for heat pumps is what's called the Dyke and Fit. And there's an enhanced version that's a heat pump. The reason we put that in is it's considered a cold climate heat pump. So it qualifies for a heat pump tax credit. Now that tax credit is actually only for primary residences. It does not qualify for investment properties, which I could go on a tangent here. I'll try not to. I think that's kind of dumb. If you want to incentivize people to use the technology, you know, investors hold a lot of properties. They should pass the tax bill in a way that <laughs> people who own properties could could benefit from that because it might incentivize them putting it in their property. But there's a long story short, there's a two thousand dollars tax credit on those heat pumps. There's also geothermal heat pumps, which qualify for up to thirty percent of the cost as a tax credit, which is massive. So that means if you spend a hundred thousand dollars on a heat pump, you know, system, which they can get that expensive on a on a very big house, for example, but you would be able to take a $30,000 tax credit from that. That's on the geothermal? That's on the geothermal. And that can start to make geothermal sound a little bit more attractive. And the 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 value proposition that we really pitch for people with heat pumps is like, if the, like, it's always our approach to sales is like, we don't say, oh, this is what you should put in your house. It's like, hey, how long are you going to be in this house? How are you planning on using it? What's the use case? And our number one question that we always ask is, do you plan on using solar or putting on solar panels? And the reason is, is because if you do, we can get rid of your bill. This is kind of what can happen with a heat pump. And that's what we like them for is because, you know, we have customers here in, if you lived in Denver in, in you know, 2021, 2022, people's gas bills basically doubled. And everyone was talking about it. You know, if you went from a $200 energy bill to heat and you suddenly had a $400 bill, that would be a, a pretty big price jump. And we had some customers who had, you know, switched over to heat pumps because they were on solar their energy bill in the you know winter was $30 and that's including a $50 connection charge so even with all the solar that they got they were able to offset 100% of their uh, capacity and heat their home and the reason that a lot of the times we put in these dual fuel systems that i mentioned which is where you'll have like a furnace paired with a heat pump that furnace might only run one or two nights a year on the coldest nights when like for example middle of january it got down to negative 15 for about four days was the that was the low so it still got up to maybe like single digit highs during the day but it was a, it was a cold snap for about four to five days your furnace will run during that time your heat pump will shut off because it's not as efficient and then when it gets back up to 10 20 degrees that heat pump kicks back in as your primary source of heat. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds where you definitely don't want to be in the middle of freezing weather without heat. And so that's why we love dual fuel systems. But the thought of saying like, oh, don't put in a heat pump because they don't work in cold weather. It's like, well, it works 99% of the time. The 1% it doesn't, we have a backup for. And and that's where, that's the number one use case that we we really put those in. 
I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. So I'm glad you brought up solar and geothermal because I think that that's an important question. Like with with uh, alternative energy sources, what uh, as you're considering what system to put in, what considerations do you need to also have in order to future proof it in case you do hook it up to solar or some sort of alternative energy source in the future? I'll start by explaining, you know. Yeah. So as far as future proofing, right, it's kind of, it's a great question. It's, you kind of want to, that's why we ask those questions of like, Hey, what what are your plans for this home? And if someone says to me, I want to live in this home for, you know, three years, and then we're going to move out, turn it into a rental or something like that. That's a common scenario. We're not even going to have a conversation about the heat pump. I'm going to say, Hey, listen, I would really recommend you put this in unless your rental plans include short-term rental Airbnb, because then you're going to be on the hook for the energy bill, then yeah, you are you might put in solar, you might put in, because especially if you think people, you, you know how you, it is when you go to a hotel, right? You set the thermostat at 65, you forget to leave the door open. And, 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 you know, it's the air conditioner is running when it's 95 degrees out and the, and the screen doors open. So it's, it's one of those things where that's a great time to you know, do what you can to save some money. But if, if you're going to turn it into a long-term rental, we would still just, hey, let's put in some basic equipment. And then when you get into your forever home, the the forever home scenario or a home where you're going to be in for, you know, 10, 15 years to where you'll be able to kind of recoup those costs. On a geothermal system, the way that geothermal works is instead of like an air source heat pump, which is like a traditional condenser that you have outside, that takes heat from outside and it transfers it to the refrigerant via the air and then sends it inside to an air handler that heats up your home and just in layman's terms. And when you get a geothermal system, what's actually happening is a contractor comes out first. You have a drilling contractor that will drill. And there's there's a couple ways that they lay loops, but typically the way they do it now is they drill about two to 300 feet deep and they drill you know, loops. Let's say for a 3000 square foot home, you might need to drill four holes. You run those loops. Those loops, and when I call them loops, they're basically, you're going to have propylene glycol or some other type of hydronic fluid running through a pipe via a pump that brings it into a heat pump. And the heat pump in itself is actually sitting inside the house. And what is happening is that it's pulling, the reason that geothermal works better than air source is because when it's like, they're very popular in Canada, because what happens and, and I, I'll get into, I'll get kind of technical just to give them, uh, your, your listeners, a really high level. But basically, there's an efficiency rating called coefficient of performance, which what coefficient of performance is, is it's power in versus heat out. Because the way you measure heat can be measured in kilowatts, just like energy can be measured in kilowatts. Now, when you use something like an electric space heater, right, that's one watt of, of power versus one watt of heat. It's just one, that's a COP essentially of one, if, is how we would describe that. Now, when you look at the coefficient of performance on a geothermal system or these air to water heat pumps, some of these newer products that are coming out, you can get a coefficient of performance as high as five, six, seven, even, which means it's seven times as efficient as like electric heat. And then 
That also means that in cold weather, the other benefit with geothermal is that because your ground loop, your ground doesn't change temperatures as much as the outside. An air source heat pump, when it gets very cold, your fit, your coefficient of performance actually drops. Like for example, to qualify for that cold climate heat pump tax credit I talked about earlier, a co the coefficient of performance only has to be 1.75 at five degrees Fahrenheit. Most heat pumps are, are that are qualify for that are above that. So they might have a coefficient of performance of two or three at that five degree mark, but they really start to drop off. And this is for air source heat pumps. The same is not true for geothermal. So because geothermal is basically circulating fluid through a giant series of loops that are in the ground, and the ground is, you know, 60 degrees basically year round. And you, you have to get the drilling contractor will tell you like kind of what your ground temp temperature is set up for because some places have deep ground freezes. And so you do have to do some due diligence in that respect. But for the most part, the ground has heat that you can extract out of it. And so that whole process. You, you get a basically a heat pump that works year round in very cold climates. And then when you start to supplement that with solar or when you do the cost analysis compared to the energy that you would be using, like a lot of these homes that do this are we see them in like these gorgeous, like stunning homes in like Boulder, Colorado or up in the mountains where they would normally have to be. You can't get a gas line up there, right? These are off the grid at 8000 feet or they're very remote. And I'm saying 8000 feet elevation. And so their options are propane. And then on the East Coast, what you see for a lot of off-grid applications is oil fired applications, and they're very expensive to operate. And so when you're talking about propane versus a geothermal setup, it could, even if you're not off the grid or you don't have good, you know, solar, you're not like a good, like you can look up what your solar score is and see if your property has a good rating. But the bottom line is like, if you just get, uh, you know, a geothermal heat pump in a place where you have access to a natural gas line, or it, it, it might not, the, the numbers might not crunch the same. So it's really good for those off-grid applications. Um, and that's why you see them in more, you know, for forever homes and things like that when people are building their dream house off-grid or that ranch in Montana or whatnot. They're they're a great option in that respect. So talk about rebates real quick. I know you you touched on them, but if someone is installing a new system, how should they assess whether there are rebates available for those systems? There's several types of rebates, and we'll kind of, I'll kind of touch on all of them. So there's number one is about manufacturer rebates. Those are normally instant and direct, meaning like we we get uh, Daikin consumer rebates that we give to the customer at the time of purchase, and then we get reimbursed for some of that or part of that from uh, Daikin. And so that's a consumer rebate. Uh, the next is going to be an efficiency rebate through your local utility. So utility providers are obviously in incentivizing people to put in more efficient equipment uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is it, you know, it, it uses less, which you would think they would want you to use more, uh, but they're actually incentivized. It's, it's a combination of legislation, but they're incentivized to keep, to put in more efficient equipment because it's actually better for the grid too. Like the part of the reason we love the Dyke and Fit is because uh, the Dyke and Fit, and, and we have a video on our channel that shows it in action. And I hook up the, a, a meter that's called an amp clamp. And what that does is that is directly pulling, like telling me how much power that system is pulling on startup. Even a big five ton system, which would be enough for to heat and cool, let's say a 3000 square foot house in Colorado. And on startup, it might be pulling one and a half or two amps. When you compare that to a single stage system, its counterpart, that would probably be pulling closer to 20 to 30 amps, depending on the system and how new it is. And so that's in term amperage is the amount it's a big power draw so it's a big inrush and so if you've ever you know had a power outage a lot of time what's happening in the middle of uh summer when there's a brownout uh well brownout is when they shut off the grid preemptively because there's too many people pulling power but a blackout when it's like oh shoot the transformer just went down that's because a transformer had too much more everyone's running their ac it's the peak of the day it's more than it could keep up with and the transformer just explodes and you'll if you live by a transformer you can hear that on your street when that thing pops it's loud it sounds like yeah it's very loud but the the bottom line is those rebates are going to be incentivizing you to put in higher efficiency equipment 
for that reason. And there's typically going to be, for example, in Colorado, we have Excel Energy. They give a rebate for high efficiency furnaces. They also give a rebate for cold climate heat pumps. And in order to qualify for those cold climate heat pumps, like a lot of the inverters do, ironically, the Dyke and Fit does not, but that's, I talk about that in another video. I'm not going to get into it here. Uh, but the bottom line is the most of the cold climate products, there's pretty stringent requirements in order to hit and you'll get a rebate for those cold climate heat pumps. There's rebates for ductless systems. And then same thing in Phoenix, for example, SRP, they give they have three tiers of rebates and they structure it where it's per ton. So you get $75 per ton for a single stage system, $150 per ton for a multi-stage system, or $225 per ton for an inverter system. And that's because they, you know, if they put, if everyone puts in inverters, they ramp up and down on a continuum. So when everyone's running their AC, it's going to be pulling a fraction of the power that everyone's single stage system would. And so that's why they incentivize people to put those in. So that's the that's the utility side of rebates. And then the last side of, of rebates is really, it's more of tax credits, not so much a rebate. So it's a tax credit. Your CPA is going to you know file the form for this. And basically, uh, the tax credits that you get, like I said, right now, the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed, which made uh, you know a lot of noise. A lot of people were asking us about heat pumps in the Inflation Reduction Act tax credit because there's a $2,000 tax credit up to $8,000. But in order to qualify for that $8,000 tax credit, you actually had to be in, it's like 80% of median income. So you had to be within a certain range, which if, you know, some of your real estate investors listing might qualify for that because of, bon you know, depreciation <laughs> and doing a good job with their taxes, they might qualify as low income, right? But, but the bottom line is that same thing that has to apply to your personal uh, taxes. It's a $2,000. For all intents and purposes, I tell people it's about a $2,000 tax credit is what you can expect. And then on the geothermal side, like I said, is they, there's a big incentive there of 30% of the actual bill and there's no cap on it. And that's for your you know personal residence as well. Let me skip to the, the part where you tell people how they can find out more about you, get a hold of you. And then you mentioned some videos that you do. Where would they find those videos as well? You can check us out on the web. Our website's thebhvac.com. We have a YouTube show called The HVAC Dope Show. If you search The HVAC Dope Show, we'll, we'll show up. And there's a lot of videos on there about how you can get the best HVAC for your home. We put out content daily and weekly on you know that topic and a lot of the newer technology that's coming out. And that's, that's how you can find us. Last question. What's your favorite hack or app? I mean, honestly, I mean, this is kind of a cop. I would say my favorite app I use all the time is YouTube because I'm always on there putting out content. But but yeah, that's probably my favorite app that I'm using right now. I don't really have a, a productivity app off the top of my head that I can recommend. But thanks for sharing this information on HVAC systems and, and the rebates that are available, the different types of systems. You know, we talked a little bit about solar and geothermal. Yeah, I think you've given us a great overall view of, of HVAC and what, what it entails. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G-Investor.com.